Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, Give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest seat. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of the Lord. Let mutual love continue. Or as another translation puts it, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. I found an interesting way to begin a passage. Let mutual love continue. I've been part of a Tolman family for a short period of time, but I would hope that it would be a welcome words of encouragement as we look forward to a 61st year. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. When Pastor Kevin invited me to share a message this morning, I considered what stage uh, atonement is in. I consider how I might uh, offer you a word of encouragement as we hit the final chapter of this transition. We say goodbye to a pastor we love, and we're called to invite into our lives a pastor who honestly, we hardly know. Many of us gathered and given an opportunity to meet uh, Pastor Gene Kelly. When he was asked, uh, when will you be starting? When will be your first week? He mentioned our 60th anniversary and said, I'll probably start after that. It makes sense, doesn't it? After all, He's coming to start a new chapter. It's always fun during anniversary celebrations to look back and appreciate all that we have done and all that we've been. To recognize all that God has accomplished to the people who gather here. Yet that's not the most important thing. What's more important than that celebration is what comes next. How will, how will we serve the Lord in the next days and the days after that? In fact, a couple, uh, a few weeks ago, I was invited to participate in the congregation that I served for some 25 years. They were having their 50th anniversary. I've been away from there for five years, and you know what? They were still having worship. They were still flourishing, even without me. Congregations always go through transitions. And I've always done much better when I've reminded myself of who's really in charge. Who makes things work. You know his name is Jesus Christ. So when we gather on September 11th and we celebrate the church who has served this community for 60 years, I'm sure there's going to be fond remembrances of all of the pastors who have shepherded here through the years. Both will remember that move from chess corners to here. 
And I believe every church needs strong pastoral leadership. And every congregation, when they talk about 60 years or any anniversary, will talk about the buildings and the, the improvements. In fact, it seems almost impossible to celebrate 60 years in one weekend. Yet there's one thing to be remembered and treasured more than everything. And I would guess that there'd be any congregation would be hard pressed to survive without it. Mutual love. That feeling of family with the folks who serve Christ with you. More than anything, that's what keeps the congregation strong and effective. See, pastors can come and go, but the mutual law has to continue. That's what the author of Hebrews understood. He says, if you're going to be the church, you've got to continue to be the church through mutual love and affection. It must abound. That's part of what Paul was pointing to when he said, be imitators of Christ. So he writes, let mutual love continue. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Keep on loving one another as Christ loves you. Through the years as I've uh, prepared to write sermons, one of the uh, first tasks I always did is I took the text for the day, and then I read it in many different translations. And almost every time, one of the translations, something would come from it that I would see it in a way that I had never seen it before. So listen to these verses 7 and 8. First, the way you heard it this morning. Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now listen to it from another version, this time the message. Appreciate your pastoral leaders who gave you the word of God. Take a good look at the way they live and their faithfulness. Let it instruct you as well as their truthfulness. There should be a consistency that runs through us all. For Jesus doesn't change yesterday, today, or tomorrow. He's always totally himself. First of all, it's a very powerful message to us as we await for our senior pastor to arrive. Next, when you think of it, that Jesus is unchanging the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, always himself, if we want to be to follow him and be like him, there must be a consistency that runs through us. If we want that mutual love to continue, there must be a consistency that runs through us. Through my entire uh, career, I've never minded that there was an expectation of, of a pastor that he must be held to a higher standard. I'm okay with that. Even Paul admitted that he had a very bad track record. After all, he, he, he said he was the chief persecutor of the church. And he identified himself as that, and that all he could depend on was the grace of God. And after that, he said, Imitate me. Imitate me. And you know what uh, the Hebrews said to imitate? Imitate their faith. It wasn't until he gave Jesus a rightful place in his life that everything started to fall into place. So what he was asking those who listened to him was not so much that they imitate the way he lived or act, acted, but rather to imitate his faith, to place their total trust in the Lord and his grace. And if you're willing to do that, everything will fall into place. So it's right for a congregation to have high expectations of their pastor, whether they know them him very well or not. I like to think that a pastor can serve as a role model for us. But each one of us must be willing to stand with grace and mercy. Of course, the instructions, the commands were not intended for pastors or church leaders only, but for all of us as Christ followers. Each of us is called to imitate Christ and have a consistency that runs through us. We're called to do the best we can to imitate Christ 24 hours a day. 
365 days a year. Each of us is to call to imitate Christ and have that consistency that runs through us. There's a saying we're all familiar with. Uh, I take two steps forward and three back. Now, when you see Jesus as the perfect model, we never can achieve that. So we feel like we're going forward and then taking three steps back. Even Paul, who admitted, uh, or was willing to say, imitate me, also understood that he wasn't perfect. Trying to imitate a perfect Christ, we can never feel like we've achieved it. Paul one time said, understanding that he fails so often, even though he's got a total faith and trust in the Lord, he says, sometimes I do the very things I hate. But then when he, he would ask them to imitate him, he said, the good that I do, not I, but the Christ that lives in me. That consistency that runs through us when Christ lives in us and directs our way. Once on Sunday morning, the pastor told his congregation that Jesus lives in your heart. At the end of the service, a little boy walked up to him and says, Jesus is in my heart. And he asked the little boy, How do you know? And he said, I feel him bumping around in there. wisdom and the simplicity of children. Perhaps that little boy had the kind of faith we all need. In our baptism, we're told that Jesus takes residence in us. It's not a temporary residence, but a permanent one. That's our hope for consistency. The more we praise Him and call on His name, the more our actions reflect in Christ within us. In the Seagulls passage, it's understood that within the Christian community, that as Christ takes hold, mutual love happens. When when this love takes hold of our hearts, we start to share our faith and our presence and our mutual love with one another, and it transforms us into Christ. Notice that the author says continue in mutual love. He didn't say begin to love one another like Christ loves you, but rather continue in mutual love. It was a love that is soft present. The kind of love that must be shared when you're part of a community. The kind of love that must be present if you've been here for 60 years. That's a beautiful thing about being a kind of that has history. And knows how to do mutual But then he expands it. He says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Remember those who are in prison as if you're in prison. Remember those who suffer or are tortured as though you are being tortured. That's how they imitate Christ. Because that mutual love, that feeling of giving and sharing and loving as Christ loves can't be contained to the congregation small fellowship. See, no boundaries are set. Christ's love is, is cast as wide and possible as you do. The, the theme for all summer has been deep and wide. That's what mutual love is supposed to be. Deep and wide. There are so many who have come to believe and so many who do not yet believe. God calls us to welcome them all. Many years ago, in fact, it was in the Old West, there were two brothers who were likable enough, likable enough, but they had a wild side. They got off track and they started stealing sheep. In fact, that's how they made their money, at the expense of the nearby farmers. But as most things, one day they got caught. Now, in the Old West, that the punishment for stealing a sheep was death. But they had been part of that community all their lives, and they didn't want to kill them. So instead, they decided, we're going to do, do the next best thing. 
They branded them with a big S T on their foreheads. Cheap teeth. Well, the one one of the brothers who was so humiliated that he just left town and never came back. But the other brother decided he wanted to make amends. He wanted to restore his relationship with the community. Now, most, most folks were skeptical. There were some who really wanted to forgive him and give him that second chance. So he started doing everything he could. If somebody was sick, he was probably the first one there to help care for them. When there was work to be done, there he was helping out. On and on and on, he became an integral part of the community. He started to be loved as he was loving. Oh, when he was becoming an old man, a uh, visitor uh, entered the community and he was sitting at a coffee shop and he noticed the man there with the biggest key on his forehead. And he noticed that everybody who walked by would stop and talk to him and breathe with him and laugh with him. Even children would come by and want a big hug from him. And he said, tell me, what does that SP mean? And the coffee cafe owner, who was actually a contemporary of him, says, geez, I don't, I don't rightly remember. But I think it stands for saint. I want, you to, I want to tell you that story because I want you to understand that mutual love is not a feeling. It's an action. Love changes you. Love demands action. It's making, making the choice to act every day for Christ. For those who are in danger or powerless, outsiders, it's a risky choice to love. That can change us at the core. And has the power to change those who 